guys, welcome to the Better Ideas Podcast. This is a podcast where I talk to creative and interesting people who inspire me to want to learn about them and share that with you guys. And today's a treat. I have a familiar name in Lawrence. If you're from around here, you may have heard of the man named Jason Barr. Jason Barr is the host of the ADD podcast, or you may know it as OMG LOL JK. Uh, and it's basically just a local podcast where they talk to all kinds of artists that come through town and do a, something pretty similar to honestly what I'm trying to do here, only he's been doing it way longer and he's way better at it and way more experienced. Uh, but yeah, that being said, he's also an artist. Um, he's a motorcycle enthusiast. He's a DJ. He, uh, he's a very interesting dude that does a lot of cool things. And I really enjoyed sitting in my living room and talking to him, and I hope to do it again. I'm going to keep this intro short because the conversation was a little bit long, um, but I'd also like to let you guys know that I'm going to be releasing two episodes this week because the other one is not an interview. It's more of a conversation, and I, I, I think, I'm thinking about adding a new segment, and if, if I do, it'll probably be called Room for Nuance. So check out that title. Keep your eye out for that one also. Um, but yeah, here's my conversation with Jason Barr. But yeah, so this is the Better Ideas Podcast. I'm here with Jason Barr. Um, you're a podcaster from Lawrence, and you're somebody who I've just been, like, I'm, I'm very new to this whole, like, I feel like this is a whole underground thing that I'm just mm-hmm. discovering that, like, there's just so much cool stuff locally in Lawrence. And, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit younger, so I'm, I'm involved in the kind of the beginning stages of the music scene, I guess you could say. Like, I know some local bands here. Uh, I've been kind of involved in that for a while, but like getting into podcasting has caused me to want to wanna branch out and just talk to more, uh, I guess, non-musicians or mm-hmm. people who are involved in the scene or in right. the community locally that, uh, that I feel like. I could learn from and you're definitely one of those people because you've been doing it for seven years you said yeah the podcast specifically yeah yeah Mm -hmm. so basically I just want to I guess start from the beginning and talk about you if that's all right yeah no I'm I'm down whatever I mean (laughs) um so you said you're not from Lawrence initially no I mean I didn't even uh I try to tell people this because when I tell people I went to high school in Olathe, they're like, oh, man, he's from Johnson County. You know, it's like the richest uh, (laughs) area in Kansas. Um, I'll say this. Like, I I grew up everywhere. I was born in Kansas City, Mm -hmm. lived on Rainbow Boulevard in the hood with my parents. My parents are artists and uh, super Christian, but I always sort of jokingly always thought they were a little more earthy and kind of hippie-ish. You know, they were like pretty open-minded and cool Mm -hmm. um, because they were artists. Mm -hmm. But then they quickly, you know, obviously, like most people they moved to California. So then, um, they just worked in, I'm not sure what they did out there other than working in it for a few different agencies. My dad actually was an a airbrush. Like he would airbrush t-shirts. Oh, he had a cool. stand on the beach yeah. and in a mall there. So I remember going and watching him make stuff for people just mm-hmm. on the fly, just your traditional, like hilariously corny, like eighties, you know what I mean? Unicorns yeah. and lions. Yeah, I think and, I like, have one of those flat build hats I got from Worlds of Fun. Yeah. The airbrush yeah. nickname. I on mean, the back just as straightforward as you think. Like yeah. a guy that makes airbrush t-shirts on the beach. That's pretty he had cool. Long though. hair, big beard. Um, uh, yeah, he was cool. And, um, but you know, being that they were from the Midwest, they kind of had this like strong, like Christian background. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, he ended up getting involved in advertising and then, uh, he transitioned into, design like graphic design he was one of the first people to get uh the test of photoshop like mm-hmm. a, like the very first like the whatever they call it what is it the beta i don't know like the beta yeah. or the, you know like to, to to learn on the first mac mm-hmm. maybe the first or second so he he was like a macintosh guy like an apple computing guy from the beginning um being that he was on the coast and then we ended up moving everywhere so i mean just like almost like being in a military family yeah so i mean i lived in california then we lived in uh, Indiana. Then we lived outside of Chicago. Um, I mean, I mean, I'm forgetting a few other things that like we lived in Colorado. We lived in, I mean, just he would work for like three or four years until he didn't really feel like as a freelance artist that he didn't have a, uh, I guess that you work yourself out of business is the way he would describe it yeah. as a freelance artist. And then he, I mean, we're talking illustrations, uh, too. So he would be doing illustration work and, um, I remember like the year that he got, he had done this lamb cause he does a lot of pen and ink and he has incredible handwriting. I mean, just mm-hmm. like bonkers. Uh, and, uh, 
he, he had done an illustration of a lamb and then that, that time magazine for some reason just stole the illustration to use for their Easter article. Dang. So he like opens up the national magazine. It's like, wait, where did this co-? like, like, and it was a full skin. I mean, a full color, nice version. It wasn't like some over pixelated thing. Wow. Cause this is kind of pre, even pre, you know, what you think of as far as computing. I mean, yeah. Um, so somehow they got a hold of this thing and they just used it thinking they could, you know, and he said at the time, he's like, well, I'm just stoked that this isn't a magazine. I don't even care. Yeah. Um, but I imagine at the time it was kind of like the Wild West, too, where you could probably of. get away with stealing intellectual property a little easier than you could now. Well, now it's just so common that it's harder. But at the time, it, I think if you wanted to go for it, you could have gotten money for it because there were a lot more old school laws before mm. the digital revolution hit mm-hmm. that did protect your work and stuff. But from his perspective, and I'm pretty sure he always kind of just said he just didn't ever feel like utilizing the law to sue someone or whatever. He, In his mind, he didn't think it was like a... a a Christian thing, you know, like he didn't want to waste his time. It was like, ah, this is just, whatever. yeah. So, um, uh, but yeah, we went from California to Chicago to Indiana. I mean, all these places and he slowly moved his way up and, and he was like the head. And this is when they still had art departments back mm-hmm. in the day where everything was internal. So my dad would work, he worked for Moody Bible Institute. He worked for another, another huge company called scripture press where he was the head art director for like these giant, you know, sort of corporate, um, design agencies that like worked for huge christian colleges and stuff right okay so So did he do like he worked in illustration there too but as the art director you're just the one you know doing everything i mean they're they're Mm -hmm. full i mean scripture press still exists but they just make curriculum that churches buy Mm -hmm. so stuff like that i mean it wasn't really at this point he had moved away from doing a lot of his own illustration work and pen and ink and the stuff that i still do Mm -hmm. um that he got me into because he's a potter as well Mm -hmm. but um so at that point, as a younger person, I, I watched him just do that, and then he became more of a, you know, kind of like whatever you would think of as like a classic, like a guy who just wears a tie to work and, you know, does graphic design, yeah, basically. Yeah. He just became like a graphic designer and then was ahead mm-hmm. of all their projects. But then, in the 90s, all of the, all of those agencies shut down, the internal agencies. So then it went all back to being freelance again. And at that point, then we had moved to Chicago and then from Chicago, he had done really well. Somehow he had just a couple years where he was just killing it. So then they thought, we're going to move back to this area because of my family's all, they all live in on the Missouri side. Mm-hmm. And uh, so somehow I ended up in Olathe, which is, which sucked, yeah. but I met a ton of cool people there. I mean, I went to high school uh, um, and worked in the same Pizza Hut as like half of the Get Up Kids. And that's okay. where I met Ryan and Robbie Pope. And then through them, that's how I met Matt prior yeah. so how old you how old were you whenever you moved so you settled i'm assuming in kansas yeah right? i mean it was just like like i said that was sophomore junior senior okay so uh i had gone to freshman year into calb high school outside of chicago into calb okay. illinois where the corn with wings mm-hmm. um cindy crawford went to my high school <laughs> okay she's older than older than me that was the only famous person i remember from there but that's <laughs> like when i started skateboarding and i kind of went from being just like just whatever. When you're a kid, before you pick your identity, mm-hmm. I kind of picked my identity of who I wanted to be, and I thought I was like a little punk rocker kid, which is hilarious. Yeah. And um, uh, and then we moved here, and um, I met a bunch of cool people, and like there were tons of kids who skateboarded. My friend Kenneth Kupfer, who goes by Value Shock, is another big great illustrator from the area who who also lived in Olathe, and I met his brother. Uh, Alex and him like had a pizza hut and, and straight up was like instant friendship and then having uh his brother who was obsessed with heavy metal and then like punk and like you know like more hard rap at the time you know like Wu-Tang and stuff just like mm-hmm. or like grave diggers and you know brother lynch hung like wild he always introduced us to crazy stuff like Gigi Allen and all of the old school like gnarly extra yeah. gnarly um I mean they were the ones who were obsessed with big brother Mag- skateboard magazine which we talked about on one of the recent shows they did the um the documentary about big brother magazine as mm-hmm. part of what was that do you remember marissa what the the big brother ma- what, what is that str- on showtime it was a showtime original documentary about the oh, yeah. yeah so that was on showtime there's a there's well, i can't remember what it's called now but there's a whole documentary about them and they were the first magazine who worked with spike jones and then all the guys who ended up becoming the cameraman and then people like bam margera all of them were uh in Big Brother magazine, it was a skateboard magazine, but it was really crazy. I mean, it was like just intentionally stupid mm-hmm. and vulgar, and there was like lots of porn and stuff in it. It was, it was just bizarre. I mean, it was yeah. like as a but you know, if you're 16, you're like, oh my god, I don't believe this exists. <laughs> it's like the Holy Grail, right? For a yeah, you know. And then after that, then like the Big Brother got purchased by Larry Flint. 
of Hustler magazine. So mm-hmm. then because he's always almost going to get in trouble, like for whatever, uh, that's the way that they were going to try to shut down porn. It was to claim that you're influencing minors or exposing minors to harmful material. So mm-hmm. then what's the worst case scenario? Well, at one of the issues, one of the last issues it got switched. So if you got it, if you had a subscription to big brother at that point, it had already gotten kind of tame. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, it came wrapped in, in in brown brown paper or maybe black plastic. I can't remember, but uh, it would come just as just like if you had a subscription to like Hustler, like Taboo magazine. Yeah. But you got your skateboard magazine, and then one so it got switched, switched they, with Taboo. So like if you had a subscription, one of the last when so it finally did happen to where you got like a porn magazine. So instead like a bunch of sixteen year old kids got, got Taboo got, magazine, wow. <laughs> which is like a hardcore. Uh, hustler, yeah, you know, could, if you can imagine Taboo being a little even edgier than the regular Hustler, which was pretty dirty at the time. Yeah. Wow. So um, basically, the, like stuff like that was like being turned on to like the the true, true like underground, uh, crazy skateboard art culture that's mm-hmm. you know with music and not just that. Big Brother, like those guys influenced me in a way that I now realize because they wrote about things in a way like they did not care. Mm-hmm. They they wrote about everything as if there was just no consequences. And technically at this point, at the age of 35, there almost aren't. I mean, you, you'll pick your lane and you'll stay in there, but you're always, it's like, again, like I, we've kind of talked a little bit about coming from like Christian backgrounds. Yeah. It's more about you. You don't realize how much is ingrained into you that you're like afraid of what people will think of you, or maybe they're going to, maybe I won't get this opportunity or I won't get that. Maybe you won't, mm-hmm. but maybe sometimes people just like, they live in like a fairy tale dreamland where you just think that these other things are going to happen to you. And, uh, I think the, uh, the reasons that things people don't get what they want or they don't get, uh, it's not because you're like cursing on a podcast or it's yeah. not because you wrote an article about X, Y, and Z. It's because your interests just are not the same. Yeah. So like, if you're going to want to be writing about counterculture, mm-hmm. you have to just do what you do now. Like as an, as an, as a journalist, you need to reach out to 20 different companies and offer up examples. I mean, you just have to work like a journalist. It's not, yeah. it's generally not like you're not going to get, uh, shunned because your content is too edgy yeah especially not now i I feel like that's definitely changed it went the other way yeah and if somebody doesn't like it then somebody else will and now it's it's accessible to kind of like there's a lot more people right because of the internet so before you might have had an issue locally or publicly and and being in olathe was bad because i felt like i didn't fit in and Mm -hmm. if nothing else it just helped me in the long run because me and my friends were very close and then we already knew that like the majority of people around us like didn't care what we did or they didn't really like or, or not, not it wasn't that they didn't like us they liked us mm-hmm. uh i was very popular but mm-hmm. b- the people who who did like us like loved us and that was when i realized that it was like oh okay but if you make content for people which it's funny we wouldn't we wouldn't have called it content then mm-hmm. but if you just made stuff that mm-hmm. you believed in and that was a big thing that i learned in college is like just make what you want to make because you want to you, i'm making something that i wish i someone else was making Mm -hmm. like I'm making this because I wish that I had this to consume. Yeah. So if there was me at 22 or me at 16, I wish I had the ADD podcast, you Mm -hmm. know, uh, or whatever I listened to. So at that time though, that would have been big brother magazine. You know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So I was like just covering a, a broad range of stuff in a very, I don't know, like, Edgy is a corny way to say it, but just like mm-hmm. in a so are in, you in a way that's just that you know that's kind of what inspired you to start ADD podcast. Well, I mean, it kind of I would say just now having to like say it out loud, looking back, it was because we started a zine and we mm-hmm. had a zine called the Daily Spank and mm-hmm. something else that was just like uh, where we just reviewed bands because we wanted to get free music. So me and Kenneth started the zine in high school, and I almost got suspended because of it. You know, because we just would write just stupid, making fun of stuff mm-hmm. in a very irreverent, is the word I was looking for, irreverent way. But mm-hmm. we got free, tons of free music. I mean, I remember um, whatever the label was that had Pennywise and like we had all the big punk labels. They would send us, I'm talking, we'd get boxes of CDs a month at some point. Hmm. And this was just to be putting out a zine, um, you know, in Olathe, Kansas. But the people yeah. who liked it were really into it. But then, dude, we'd drive down to Kansas City and we met up with, uh, there's a, there used to be this record label called Barbershop Records. And uh, it was like all of the, and then we would like drive down into the hood and somehow Alex would just meet these people when he'd go looking for a local rap. Mm. And then he, we met with this guy named Romeo Rynell and he had all these other people and he had a barber chair in his house. And uh, I mean, this was as real as it gets. But so somehow it's like, we just figured out um, as like bored, mm-hmm. like dorky white kids 
that we could go somewhere else. But then they were like, no, we like these guys because maybe they're not scared enough. Like they don't know they should be scared. Yeah. Like, we went to Romeo Rynell's uh, birthday party and it was like a crazy party. And we ended up, we were underage. Mm-hmm. And then he ended up, I don't know what happened, but like we weren't even drinking. Do you know what I'm saying? Like we're there participating in this crazy thing and these girls were sitting at the table. Oh, there we go. Interruption. This is my girlfriend, no, Sarah. Right. Hey. Hey. Oh, it's all oh, you're good. It's going good. <laughs> we kind of we kind of dragged our feet for a while there. We were we were warming up. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's all right. So for the listeners, my girlfriend got home from work, and that's the sound you heard. If I don't cut that out, <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, we can do a hard cut. Yeah, here. yeah. Okay, um, so you're talking but, about like, so we're at this party, like we're at Romeo's mm-hmm. party, and it's like just me and all the guys I skateboard with, right? And but we're not, but we didn't know enough to be like obviously we had to look super young. I mean, we were still in high school. Like you you don't look old. Right. But then people kept going up and getting waters and stuff. So in our mind, it was like, well, we're not trying to break the law, but we were there and all these other girls would come and sit at our table. Mm -hmm. Cause obviously we're like, we don't look like anybody else there. And we, even though we were a pretty diverse group of kids, but we all just look like skater kids from Olathe or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, and then at some point the girl's like, you should probably move. I'm like, what do you mean? And she's like, they're about to fight behind you. Uh. And then I turned around and this huge fight erupted and this guy like threw a guy into a, a big picture that was framed on the wall Dang. and into a desk or into a table. And so then, what were you guys doing there though? Well, we were just there cause we would go and we would get records from them and we would bring them back to a Latha to sell. Uh, okay. And this was all Alex's idea. I mean, I was just on the periphery. Like I was just helping him do it, but this was mostly all Alex who was just for some reason, I think he just wanted to do something that was different and we would take him to the high school and we'd sell him out of the trunk of our car to all the other kids who thought they were tough. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yo, yeah. have you heard this? This is the cool music that's coming out of Kansas City. Like, this is the really, like, this is the hard stuff. Like, this is real. Yeah. And then they would come to us and they loved us for that because, like, they're not, they're not going to go down there. They're not going to be driving. Because, like, when we're driving to this guy's house, we'd have people yelling at us on the corners, you know, like, like what the hell are you doing in our neighborhood? You know, it was, it yeah. was intense. It was crazy. I'm like, in hindsight, it's like, yeah, it's probably dumb. We were probably a little na- <laughs> naive. But then right after the fight happened, then somebody from, like, the management in the place they'd rented out, they were like, you 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 and they looked at him and he's like they're cool he's like no they gotta go you know so stuff like (laughs) that like when i look back it's like we we just constantly were doing things and putting ourselves in situations that were probably crazy but it was fun to write about and you know if we were smarter we probably would have even been filming you know Mm. to just we could have easily had a video magazine yeah um and and we were just those people and i think you just have this it's you're either that that was when we realized that we actually had journalistic there was a possibility that we could be journalists, but in our own way. Because mm-hmm. advice was around, other things were around, um, things that are now ubiquitous that people think of when they think of like, you know, oh, edgy, contemporary journalism. Well, I mean, I don't know. I'm not... I'm not yeah, even, it just made me think of like the early days of Vice, right. like Shane Smith, right? you know, going and, into these war zones. <laughs> right, and all this stuff I can never tell because a lot of times, you know, Vice gets heat for just sort of, it's almost like white people going to crazy places and then being like, look how wild this is, you know? And yeah, it doesn't seem yeah. that like look how people deep. live every day. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't seem that deep. It just seems like you're mm-hmm. just making yourself look cool. But mm-hmm. obviously though, you their vice has done some crazy stuff and they've changed media period. I mean, and now that they're like connected to CNN, CNN, mm-hmm. I think maybe either owns them or they're partnered with them. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's, we're in a, we're in a whole new world, but being younger and doing that, like I said, there's just, I was making all this art and, we were making these zines and selling them, making music and mm-hmm. just doing everything you do as a young guy. And then, mm-hmm. you know, fast forward to this moving to Kansas and or moving to. So then I they just by default, I went to Lawrence. I moved to Lawrence mm-hmm. at the time, though. Did you like realize what you guys were doing for the music scene at all? Like, no. I mean, or did that idea ever cross your mind? of what? Like, hey, we're actually making the music scene here better by, you know, going and buying all these records and selling them out of our cars at school yeah i mean at the time i mean honestly like if i if i ever said that i had a plan or if anything was like planned out i think i'd probably be doing a lot better if i wasn't just shooting from the hip you know yeah i'd be much more successful or uh in a more stable place you know but i feel even though i'm doing i mean i'm doing okay i I think i have a pretty good life here in lawrence but Mm -hmm. um no i mean at the time it was just i mean it kind of but there wasn't it wasn't anything other than it was just another adventure you know, yeah. you just na- we just naturally like to go get out. I mean, you're in Olathe. There's nothing to do in Olathe. Yeah. There's less to do in Olathe than there is in Lawrence. And I complain about how everyone just drinks here all the time, and there's not a whole lot to do. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, 
w- without because we like Marissa and I we drive to Kansas City constantly to mm-hmm. do stuff. We we'll just leave and and to go cover things for the podcast or, um, yeah, and just to come up with other topics that are just you know like what's going on at the art museum, what's going on at uh, you know all the various you know local music venues out there. Like we just drove out to Mini Bar because through uh, we ride motorcycles mm-hmm. and uh, through our, all of our group of friends we had met a bunch of really cool ladies and some other people like a couple weeks like maybe a couple months ago over the mm-hmm. summer and then just through that you know we i find out this uh our friend nancy is like a badass illustrator and mm-hmm. she helps book stuff at uh mini bar and then whatever there's another really cool bar in ecan city that she also does some booking with okay. so she was able to plug me in now granted these aren't gonna be huge shows but it's just a fun again you got to just participate in like where you live you know yeah yeah y- you're not always going to get the most mileage out of it but if you're not down for your community mm-hmm. then you just forget that people just kind of yes yeah, you know, see, yeah I, do I feel it. like i'm kind of learning that too because i i almost overlooked lawrence you know like with my band our whole goal well i our band actually recently broke up sure. but um with music in general my whole goal has always been to get out of here you know yeah <laughs> like, well and you know it's get, not a bad idea <laughs> yeah yeah but like uh I don't know, like, we've always been, like, so focused on let's just play locally enough to, you know, have a, kind of a little fan base and uh, and then, you know, go and play in other cities and things like that. But, I don't know, I guess now I'm, I'm my eyes have been open to this whole, like, subculture and, like, all of these cool, like, all the stuff that you're talking about and, like, all of, you know, like, the Dave Bazan and Matt Pryors and you and... Uh, like Ed Rose and like all these these cool people that are still like active and doing stuff in right. Lawrence. Like this is like this whole underground community, I guess. Of yeah, people. I mean, Bazan lives in Seattle. Yeah, yeah. But um, like the the thing is, is that like I feel like the music. Yeah, scene I guess. Was I mean, I'm better. just saying like the the connection. Yeah, it's still Dave possible. Like, no, yeah, it's like, definitely like that, you it's, you can still be connected to like people who are really still changing culture don't let anybody tell you if you live in lawrence that you can't be yeah, heard yeah. or that, you, that people won't take you seriously but also know that lawrence is very small and that just like when i asked matt like why do you still live here like you're successful like why wouldn't you move to a bigger city and he just looked at me and he said well jason this is where i keep all my shit yeah <laughs> you know and so so the whole point now that what i've realized getting a little older um, cause you know, you just blink, man. I mean, I was here at 22, you blink and it's like, boom, you're 35. You're like, what happened? I thought 35 was like, you're dead. Yeah. I didn't think you're, I didn't, I thought you're old. Like no one would care what you have to say, but I didn't realize that it, sometimes it takes 10 years of, of doing something to where you actually become good, really good at it. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, it's just that when we're young, we're like really egotistical and we think like everything you do is good. And then you, then later you're like, oh man, I really sucked for so long. Yeah. I'm really glad I just kept doing it. Yeah, because you yeah. just have that's all it is it's just to keep that I'm not like that's the secret if I tell anybody a secret on this podcast it's just to keep doing it keep making stuff mm-hmm. because it's going to take you at least 10 years mm-hmm. unless you are a savant and at that point you probably already have a scholarship to somewhere in a giant city where they're going to pay for your whole life that you couldn't afford yeah but if not it's just it, the trick to being a successful artist that people like is to keep working because if you don't have any natural talent or if you're just not good then you'll get no one will ever pay attention to you and you'll get pretty frustrated and you'll have you'll move on almost out of necessity mm-hmm. because it'll just seem pointless. Yeah, I feel like that's your when you cross the line into making art for other people is when you you're definitely going to lose interest in it too. Cuz it's like you said like do it because like when you uh when you started out doing this or like making music mm-hmm. or making art it's always like I want to make something that I haven't seen that I feel like needs to be made. So mm-hmm. at that point, you're just doing it for yourself. You're doing it for yourself, but you're also doing. You're doing. I'm doing this every time I turn this on. I'm doing this for like the 18 year old me, mm-hmm. you know, or the 17 year old me, like the guy who's frustrated, who came from a Christian background, who maybe has some weird guilt issues surrounding literally everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you can relate. It's it's just. I mean, most Christians, people who come from any background of faith, not even Christianity, but things that deal with morality and in, in interesting ways at times. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm doing that for them because I felt like it took me forever, it, almost embarrassingly so, mm-hmm. to really finally shed certain things and be like, man, none of this matters. Like, I just need to just be me and make the art I want to make. And no one cares. I was so insecure when I was making my show in the beginning. I would edit the hell out of it. I would say things that I thought were true or maybe that I felt compelled to say, but then I would put the episode out and I would freak out. I'd have a panic attack like four hours later and I'd go back and I'd re-edit the episode so that it wouldn't, that part wouldn't be in there. Mm -hmm. And at some point I just stopped doing that. Mm -hmm. I was like, man, no one, people care. They're listening. I can see the numbers and they're going up Mm -hmm. consistently. 
Uh, and because uh, I always told myself if it went down, if it started, to, you know, if you could really see that the wave had crested, that I would just move on to something else. Yeah. But the numbers were still going up. I would rarely get any negative feedback other than in real life. If people are like, man, you're being really negative online or, you know, maybe chill with this. Yeah. Uh, just as a habit, as a guy who's suffered like with from <clears throat> being like manic depressive, mm-hmm. you know, the, it, sometimes I get down and it's like hard not to be negative. Right. Mm-hmm. And if you're talkative, then you're just going to say some dumb stuff occasionally. Right. Yeah. But the more I did it, the better it got. I became a better interviewer. I had to edit less. Uh, I actually got more opportunities, which meant I didn't want to spend as much time in post on the mm-hmm. podcast. Yeah. And I got better guests. And I realized that most of the time people would just do it. Now, granted, people weren't really doing podcasts then either. I mean, there wasn't mm-hmm. that many. Mm-hmm. And it was, now I feel like everybody's, there's so many podcasts. Yeah. But that also means that you just have to make sure your podcast sounds really good, make sure it's really well edited, not overly long. Uh, and then, uh, you know, just make a good, consistent product that comes out on a schedule mm-hmm. because people really want that. And uh, the more you do, then the, the you know the more people will take you seriously. Again, just continuing to do it, making it better. And uh, you know, the other thing was the podcast gave me something to offer people. Mm-hmm. So when I showed up somewhere, I'd be like, "Hey, do you want to come on my show?" And like, I can help promote this show for you, or I can help promote your art opening, or I and 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 it was more about becoming an asset to my community and then just the community at large. So that's just like the underground. Yeah. Like what can you do for them? And once the you thing. do that, you'd be surprised, man. Doors open. People really like you. Uh, they, you know, I don't know if you're an artist, man, I feel like we're a sensitive bunch. We're a little more, I mean, maybe everyone's sensitive and insecure, but I feel like most artists are like even more sensitive, you know, or at least open about it. A yeah. They more. just <laughs> kind of get a little, they're a little more, uh, I don't know. You're vulnerable to really make great art. You have to be vulnerable. Yeah. And if you're not, then it's pointless. And even, even, and again, then I kept having these conversations where even if part of me was embarrassed about how goofy I was or not good at interviewing or Mm -hmm. talking about myself too much or something along those lines that I tried to really get better at interviewing them to get them to open up. Mm -hmm. Um, I would always get like some sort of nugget of information like Travis Miller, um, one, another guy who also went to my high school who did all that original Get Up Kids art. He's one of the biggest illustrators in the freaking world now, mm-hmm. living in LA, living the dream. It's incredible. And he's always, I've known him from day one. Uh, you know, I was, fr- was friends with his brother in high school too. And I visited him out in California and mm-hmm. done some cool stuff with him, uh, continue to keep up with him. But he told me, he's like, well, definitely don't, I mean, don't do this for any other reason than like, you have to do this. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't make art unless you have to make art because yeah. the real you're not going to you might end up becoming very successful and making money at it but the odds are not in your favor mm-hmm. and especially with music. So if you're doing it that can't be the goal. That no. I mean I mean yeah. you you might be able to still go to school to learn how to like fine tune it or like hone your skills so that you could just do illustration or do graphic design but generally you're not going to do like fine art where it's just your imagery, just your style. Um, if you're going to really make money, it's going to be in an, in, in an industry in which they are going to uh, put you in a box mm-hmm. because they have to be able to say, look, no, this is what we do. Yeah. You're just the cog in a wheel. Yeah. And, and then, then like you'll get a chart. It's like for anybody to do art the way that they really want to, you can't have that happen. You can't have that creative box because then you're just, you're not growing at that point. But some people are smart and they have that other part of their brain mm-hmm. where like a good illustrator where they understand, okay, I just need to get a style yeah. that is my style and I have a world of imagery I draw upon. And then when you give me an assignment, I just then do exactly what you want, but in my style and you already know what my style looks like. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't veer wildly left or right and yeah, things yeah. like that. Then And even that, it took me this long now to where I know what my style looks like when I draw and I know the type of color palette and like how the finishing works and like exactly how to make it even. Mm-hmm. So I can make it as a print. I can make it as a painting on a wall. I can make it as small paintings. I can make them grow. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it took me forever. I mean, mm-hmm. almost like as if I'd gone through my own pacing with like going to grad school, which I have. Mm-hmm. I just have an undergrad in printmaking yeah, from yeah. KU. But, so like you're going to figure it out either either way. Right. If you, if you, if you put in that it. many hours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I continue to do the podcast just because I kept getting good Every episode, I'd have something good, like a mm-hmm. groundbreaking thing. Or and is this when you lived in Overland Park still? No, I didn't even do the podcast when I lived there. I didn't do it till I moved to Lawrence, and then it was in the heyday of Lawrence.com. So that would have been 2001, 2002. I was okay. in college then, and then I was talking to the editor who was the 
I get, I'm again like the Lawrence.com editor, which is they used to be this big website, like mm -hmm. winning national awards, and they just covered the music scene here. The music scene was booming at the time, and yeah, uh, early 2000s. That because that's yeah. when the Get Up Kids right. were getting really everything big was everybody and... that I was friends with was like touring the country, and 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 that's when Range Life Records started popping. So like you know bands mm -hmm. like uh, Fourth of July and other stuff were like really popular just through because they had connections with Saddle Creek and Omaha so I got became good friends with a lot of those guys mm -hmm. and a lot of it was like honestly man like I owed I owed a lot to like Ryan uh and Robbie Pope from the Get Up Kids I mean those guys would just take I would I was some nerdy annoying kid but they were super nice to me mm -hmm. and I was just as much of a spaz if not more than I am now mm -hmm. with like spiked hair and freckles and just you know motor mouth and they'd still take me every whenever I'd show up to their shows they'd take me to whatever band was there and they'd be like this is Jason he's an artist and you know blah, blah, and be super cool and introduce me to so many people I would never mm -hmm. get to meet much less have wow. like an in, you know, Yeah. to be like, yeah. yeah, I'm like Ryan's punk kid friend, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, those guys, I love them to death. They're great. And, um, you know, and even Travis, like other people like that, like they just, if you have cool friends who, who, um, are generous, you know, sometimes they'll introduce you to people that, um, will, will help you maybe get a few steps in the direction that you want to go. Mm -hmm. And then in the end, you know, it's just still working and, and maintaining that. But, I was here and then just living, like I said, almost like, like when I'm trying to explain like how we were when we were kids, but it was just that, but now we can drink. Yeah. So it was crazier here. And every time I'd see Phil, who was the editor at Lawrence.com, he'd be like, man, bar, like your stories are nuts. Like every time I see you, you have the craziest story. Why don't you write those down and we'll pay you. Mm. So then, and I was like 19 or something. Mm -hmm. And which is kind of crazy too. Cause sometimes when you're young and then you get a lot of attention, it can be kind of do weird things to your brain yeah um so then at some point i didn't really know i did stop writing for a while because like i wrote for two or three years for them and then the blog turned into a podcast and then i did a ton of those mm -hmm. where i just show up with the microphone and interview bands here or go to kansas city and interview people and it was all about promoting what next things were coming until that site crashed and mm -hmm. it, it crashed and got revived a few times and then after that i, I finally was talking to the, the last editor that they had and i said look add is is mine but mm -hmm. i just want to make sure i want to kind of have your blessing just to make sure we're doing this kosher and professional and like mm -hmm. can i take this i mean is this really my intellectual property or did like you guys somehow do yeah. you guys somehow own this and i'm just dumb and i don't i don't know yeah because i still kind of went about it in that like punk way where it was like i'm just making a bunch of stuff and they're like by doing it with them i had an automatic thousand hits yeah um yeah per episode or whatever didn't matter um and, I, and thankfully, that was, I was able to just start up my own thing on iTunes. And um, my friend at the time, Nate Bunnyfield, helped me get it on iTunes. And he helped me um, figure out how to produce it. And I did. There's another show, which I, is very old, but we did it at uh, Liberty Hall. It was called The Hall Monitors. I'm pretty sure it's still online. And we just talked about new releases and movies. And it was me and Styles and uh, Maggie, who I don't think she doesn't work at Liberty Hall, but people who were just like the old uh, video store clerks. Mm -hmm. So it was like a video store podcast run by uh, everyone who worked at the video store and then me at Liberty Hall. Oh, okay. So uh, we did that. And then we just, I've just continued to do ADD in some form. Not, I didn't always release as frequently, but again, it was just my way to get in the door. And Twitter was kind of new. Mm -hmm. And I was getting pretty good at that. And then just being that it was for people who like to talk a lot. Yeah. Then I think somehow locally it blew up. Mm -hmm. So I, I, out of nowhere, I had, you know, as many people reading my tweets as like anybody else in town that was much more famous than I was. Yeah. So it helped. And I could just get interviews. So I mean, I, like, I met Bazan because I just, I was drunk at uh, Louise's West on a Sunday mm -hmm. and I tweeted at T.W. Walsh, who we all know is like his like right hand man and engineer and like yeah. producer. And he has that line, you know, I believe in. T.W. Walsh, he mentions him in a song, mm -hmm. and I saw that he was on Twitter, and it blew my mind, and I tweeted at him, like, hey, would you come on my show? And then he came on the show, I called him and did the show, and but then I still wanted to know a lot about <laughs> Bazan, because I hadn't even met him yet, Yeah. and um, there's a song called Borrow My Vibe by T.W. Walsh, and um, it was kind of very, it seemed very critical, because I knew that they, their relationship had kind of fallen apart at some point, mm -hmm. and he wasn't in the band anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, because he, he toured with Bazan for a while, and they, they they referred to him as the first official band member. That's what the press would always say because he yeah, always just yeah. sort of had hired guns. Yeah, when he was doing Page of the Lion, it was still just him, but nobody else was really that important. Okay. Um, it was just like again, they were just hired guns. Yeah, but T.W. Walsh was seen as like a legitimate band member. Yeah, and 
apparently my questioning in this, I was like, was that about like your relationship, like falling apart with Dave and like, was he hard to work with? And like, like I just really started digging in that. And then, so then later after that episode was out, I think I actually did the job of a real journalist where you ask questions mm. that might make them uncomfortable and like, you don't care if they like you. Yeah. Um, Cause that's like what a real journalist does yeah. um, to get the story. And I wasn't doing it on purpose. That's, that's the worst part is that I was just, I'm just a geek and like, I really geek out over just Dave's really stuff. wanted to know. I'm like really passionate about you how much I love his work. Cause it really yeah. helped me through some parts of my life. And I also loved, I mean, I thought T and TW Walsh had a new album out and mm. it was awesome. And I genuinely like his work, but I think he felt like, maybe it was like a weird surprise attack interview. And like, it, I, he yeah. didn't feel like I was, uh, he even said on Twitter, cause I tagged Dave. I was like, Hey, uh, TW just did the show. Would you do my show next? And Dave was like, sure. And then he then commented like, Oh man, you know, this is some bullshit or something. Like you just had me on your show so you could get to Dave or something like that. He like literally tried to call me out like really? on the internet. And again, but that was stuff where the internet, then everyone else can see this. So then it didn't really matter in hindsight. It just made me look more, important yeah and that's not even what you were doing and, and not at all like i said yeah. there, i had no there is no planning involved i'm mm -hmm. just shooting from the hip and sometimes most of the time it goes really well and occasionally it goes spectacularly bad mm -hmm. but it's always public yeah so then once someone is responding to you and speaking to you like as their peer then mm -hmm. you've now it's like guilt by association yeah to where but in a good way you know what i mean just like i said mm -hmm. like getting on mike maxwell's show stuff like that then it elevates you and even even just talking to people on your show people just assume you're friends mm -hmm. like they're like well they're talking to you you guys must be friends sometimes yeah. you become friends sometimes you'll never talk to that person again but uh i mean or like uh and then later here's the funny thing though a couple so then he like got mad at me and he like talked all this shit and then uh, unfollowed me on Twitter <laughs> and it's all this like juvenile stuff, you know, for like a grown man to be, and I even talked about Dave and he's like, well, you know what? He can only be himself, you know? Mm -hmm. And obviously as you've seen, he's been on my show three times since then. I go to see him in Kansas city. Um, he sends me all of his albums uh, before they come out. Dave I, was on? Yeah. Like okay, we're tight yeah. now. Like I, I love that guy. He has legitimately helped me through some of the craziest times of my life. Cause he just knows, I don't know. It's weird. I don't really have a relationship with anyone else like that where like, I didn't know them before and they were just someone I was very into their music and then yeah. became friends. And every time he comes through, we'll chill at my studio and hang out. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we went up and hung out with them in Kansas City this last thing and he hooked me up with like the new album. And yeah, I heard that episode that you did with them where he, he played oh, a man. couple songs. Yeah. And even that, you and, can tell. I mean, that's a different, that's yeah. a different, really. I was going through some hard stuff then and he just, he just called me up and sang to me. Yeah, these brutal songs, and I even requested songs, you know, specifically about divorce and things like that, and, <laughs> and it was, you know, is is intense. I mean, it was, but it was so cathartic. And mm -hmm. that I always tell people, like, I just do the show because I can't afford a therapist. Yeah. <laughs> so you you can you can expect that if you tune into my show that it's there you might be uncomfortable, but not, but again, not it's not pretentious. Yeah. In no way do I think that I'm like this like famous cool guy. Like I'm just a guy who does this thing mm -hmm. that a few people like and a few people really like. Mm -hmm. and a lot of people are just like eh, who's that guy yeah so i mean as long as you're just you're just you just acknowledge that i, I mean if nothing else i think i'm a hard worker mm -hmm. but you know I, but then again though i have i mean schoolboy q you know he's huge right I mean, he's millions of followers on twitter when he came through and, and did his show at the at liberty hall he showed up late to a show that was an underage show and then it wasn't even that bad of a show like all the other openers were pretty cool i'm pretty sure there were some other pretty big uh, rappers that opened for him that were okay. But then he showed up at the very end and then continued to try to play after midnight. And he was like bragging about how he had sold out the show and everything. And he couldn't, he threw a hissy fit mm -hmm. and then riled the crowd up of like all mostly minors who had snuck in when we're on drugs or were wasted. I mean, it was a wasted audience. And then he basically, I thought he was going to get him to like tear apart Liberty hall, which pissed me off. That's a venue that we love. Yeah. Um, and then the people who are all my friends who are staff putting mm -hmm. them in danger. Some, millionaire asshole mm -hmm. is going to get up there and that and as if he doesn't know that a, you dude you didn't sell out this show here's the deal if you wanted to make this a 21 and over show you really think you're going to sell out doubt <laughs> doubtful schoolboy yeah. q so then he comes here when i wrote about it the next day on my site and i just put him on blast and about, you said there were locals on the show too well no no like he was touring with a big uh i mean like indie like hip hop acts like oh, okay. he, he might have had like yeah, vic yeah. mensa and like some other people who are pretty notable at this point mm -hmm. um other hip hop people opening. So it wasn't like the show was bad and I thought the show was bad. I just thought he was a prick mm -hmm. and delusional and being intentionally misleading. And then he went on Twitter and put Liberty Hall on blast and then used super childish, stupid language saying like he thought it was gay or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, really, you're a grown man 
And but it's just obvious you're in, you're a moron because if you didn't realize the only reason you sold out the show is because there was minors there, and then on top of that, like you were late, like it was your fault. Don't blame the venue. Don't blame anyone else. Your own promoter is the one who pulled the plug because there were police there already. Yeah, yeah. So he then tried again. It's just like this manufactured rebellion. I find so pathetic and corny. Yeah, and yeah. so then I just put him on blast. Well, then he read the article, and I'm pretty when I'm writing, I can be pretty point pointed. And mm-hmm. I, I mean, he got roasted. I mean, I nuked that guy mm-hmm. for being an idiot. And I liked his music. I still, I think his new album's really good. Yeah. I think he's good. But he's also, I also think he's probably the luckiest guy in the world to just happen to be friends with Kendrick Lamar. Yeah. Like that dude should be counting his lucky stars. Hey, Schoolboy Q, if you're listening to this, you're not that talented. Like <laughs> you're surrounded by a lot of other people who are making you sound great. You, <laughs> sure, you're a great lyricist. You, you're the king of struggle rap. You come from a gang, whatever. Kiss my ass. But like, <laughs> In the end, he came to our town and he just disrespected my favorite venue. He put yeah. my friends at risk, and then he pretended to be this like. And again, I'm not saying he's. I mean, I'm sure he is a tough guy. He was. He's. He's lived a hard life. He lived in places I've never been. But as far as I'm concerned, I don't. I don't respect anybody that comes somewhere and there comes somewhere and then essentially, like, manufactures a problem or mm-hmm. manu- manufactures a a thing to then rebel against or to be and it's like dude this is so whack like we treated you so well and you just and it's just because we're in kansas so like we're a flyover state that's why they had flyover fest it's like people just constantly ditch on us Mm -hmm. and uh you know but then so then he responded to me on twitter with his millions of fans and was like just going off on me and arguing with me well that was another huge thing and he was like you know you're lucky mr bar he's like i'm making you famous right now and i was like oh thank you so much mr q you know, like I just—I don't know what I'd do in without a way, you. Though he kind of probably was, though, because <laughs> if he's tweeting at you, then that yeah. means millions of people. It are makes, seeing it. yeah. No, I've never been called, uh, and again, t- trigger warning for some some language here. I've never been called a faggot more times in one day mm. than all of his really smart fans out there. Yeah. I mean, I must have been called that like six hundred times, tweeted at me. Jeez. And and then that's when I'm thinking to myself, really, oh boy. This is what an intelligent demographic this guy's appealing to. Yeah. Um, But again, it's also probably young people. And, you know, I mean, people use stupid language when they are uh, younger. But, you know, again, it's like, I'm sorry, it's 2017. I don't tolerate that language from anybody. Um, And the only time people say it is to be edgy or to be intentionally crude or intentionally trying to push people's buttons now. Because we already know that, like, there's certain hate language, you know, uh, that, that people use that aren't being funny. Or yeah. culturally, it's a little different, right? So again, but it did. But that's what I'm getting at. It said it, it did, though, in some sense. Like it did mm-hmm. elevate me as a journalist. And people, they're like, "Oh, he can write something that will make someone respond." Who, if he would have just ignored me, that would have been nothing. It would have just been people in Lawrence, Kansas. Yeah. But yeah. then when I wrote that article, and then he was he was furious. Yeah. And and he tried to even spin it as like I was talking down to his fans. I was like, "No, I'm talking down to you." And I am also talking down to your fans because they were morons. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I've never seen a more wasted bunch in my life, even though I probably have been in a wasted bunch, maybe <laughs> even more wasted than everyone there. Yeah. But I still think I'm better than them. <laughs> no, I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's just, a, it's, just a, yeah, it's just a silly, it's just a stupid thing, like all this stuff. But then you realize when you look back that you're like, again, I didn't think he was going to talk to me. I'm just, I was pissed off. Yeah. I couldn't believe the way the show went down. I was really looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. I, up until that point, I was a huge fan. And, and then after that, I was like, wow. So I've like gotten, I've, now I've gotten into a fight with this guy? This is really weird. Like, yeah, that's crazy. That's not what I wanted you to happen. find yourself in such an unexpected. But it was like T.W. Walsh all over again. Mm-hmm. Except T.W., I honestly was not trying to yeah. fight with him. And it hurt yeah. my feelings. Like I was like, oh no, what do I do? But then I realized I got another show to do next week. Yeah. And I'm going to forget about it. And Just now, keep moving. But the funny thing is, he's out now with a new record, and he refollowed me finally. Yeah. <laughs> so now he'll, he's talking to me again. Maybe you should have him on now. He, oh, he's coming back on. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, that's what cool. I mean. Like, it's been, because now, I mean, we're going on year eight. Mm-hmm. Maybe even year nine. I don't know. We've been doing this for so long. It's like, it, it doesn't even matter. Like, all mm-hmm. this stuff, if you want to be a good journalist, you just need to be funny and come out with your guns blazing and mm-hmm. just do whatever you want. Like, again, make the art that you want to make. Be unapologetic about it. And unless you are actually a jerk, like a real jerk, not mm-hmm. just trying to be funny like I am on this podcast, mm-hmm. but like a real jerk, people can tell, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. But I don't know. Yeah, it's, I think people bizarre. just want authenticity. Yeah. You know? And if, if nothing else, when I talk to other people, um, you know, why do you care so much? Because I always would say I take a lot of really inconsequential inco- shit very seriously. Or I take a lot of silly shit very seriously because mm-hmm. my art is very like tongue in cheek 
and my art is all based on stuff that is like intentionally childlike or intentionally raw. Mm -hmm. So to me, the aesthetic of outsider art or, um, like I'm going to have a very serious conversation with you about, you know, some guy that's like a farmer, you know what I mean? That just makes crazy mosaic dicks out in the country or something. And, <laughs> and, I, and I look at this and I'm like, this is, this is better art than I've ever, you know what I mean? Look at like, or yeah. I mean, I mean, maybe take away the, the penis joke, but like, you know, like a garden of Eden or something, you know, where somebody yeah. spends their entire life just making crazy religious mosaics that when you look at it, it's just overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And and you look at that and you go, well, anybody could say, well, this is not really art because they're going to compare it to like some Da Vinci thing. Mm -hmm. But I felt from a very early age that I liked all that outsider art, which then, of course, the older you get, it gets consumed into popular culture. So that became street yeah, art. It's like it goes back and forth, you know, like there's like something that's counterculture. If it's good enough, it seems like it will almost like cross over into the mainstream and then it then it's no longer counterculture, even well, though it kind of started look, out that way. The perfect perfect example is like the Moldy Peaches, that mm -hmm. band that was on K Records, and they, they sing like t super twee folk pop, but it's really crappy at times. Like the way, I mean, we're talking like their voice is cracking or they're like messing up and laughing, mm -hmm. but they have a few songs that are really poignant mm -hmm. and beautiful and fun. And But then there's a lot of other lyrics in there that are like super crude, where she says, uh, like, shook a little turd out of the bottom of my pants. <laughs> like, there's stupid lyrics, but then yeah. that stuff got picked up and was in that movie Juno. So then suddenly uh, yeah. something that's super underground that you'd only hear on KJ that I thought was like my jam because that was what I liked when I was in college was like sad boy home recorded like the microphones or Mount Erie or yeah. whatever the stuff that was like really labored over but meant mm -hmm. to sound lo-fi. Mm -hmm. um, and then because the mainstream doesn't understand how like the lo-fi technology works or maybe even making the type of art that I make mm -hmm. that I have to labor over it just as much as someone else who does like a realist portrait of your face mm -hmm. because it's just a different way to do it. Cause it requires restraint and understanding when to stop. Yeah. It's kind of like, uh, who was it? I could totally screw this up. I believe it was Picasso, um, mm -hmm. who learned how to do proper, uh, like Renaissance period mm -hmm. portraits and things like mm -hmm. that in order to backtrack That's and go back saying. to that abstract thinking. And they, so it's like they even, they use the fundaments of mm -hmm. all of the, the, the proper way of doing yeah. things, the mainstream to kind of use that to inspire the, right. the abstract thought and the abstract mm -hmm. way of going about because things. Because you have to understand all the stuff, whether it's gestalt theory that they teach at KU or mm -hmm. understanding color and composition and, um, all of that stuff. Like mm -hmm. I had to learn all that in order to be able to make the art that I want to make, which mm -hmm. is very juvenile and very funny and tongue in cheek and oftentimes crude or just like very cartoonish. But that's what actually I think kind of gives me the chip on my shoulder mm -hmm. is that a lot of times, you know, you just have to then accept, look, if this is what you want to make, cause it is, it's what I get the most enjoyment out of. And that's mm -hmm. what I like to look at, you know? So yeah. whether it's the artist, Chris Johansson or, uh, Ed Templeton's work for the guy that was like the the main art director and the creator of Toy Machine. He was a huge influence on me. He is awesome. Um, I'm trying to think of the guy Chris something who just did. They put out a book by his called LSD World Peace, and he does a lot of weird, super raw like kind of pop. I mean, uh, pop art stuff that uses a lot of like older like it's nostalgia heavy, mm -hmm. which a lot of my work sometimes gets accused mm -hmm. of being that way because um, some people see that as cheating. You know, mm -hmm. if you throw in a Mickey Mouse or you throw in like a Ninja Turtle. Because people are like, oh, man, I really like that one because it has Skeletor in it. Yeah. But to me, it's like I'm trying to create a more of an overall, like a soup out of this, you know? Like yeah. I'm, like yeah. I'm putting all these faces together. And these are prints, right? Well, these, I, I do prints, but most of these are actual, uh, I do color balls where I'll take paper and I just do overlapping colors to where all they, they, they come together to create new colors and you're just mm -hmm. blending thin watercolor. And then I'll go over the top of that with just like tons of faces. So it's a very simple okay. process, but it even took me, I had to do over 200 of those to mm -hmm. where I finally was like, I got, I found the right pens that I get from Japan mm -hmm. and which Wonderfair carries now, thank God. And then using like a brush pen, using a brush, using uh, felt tip paint pens mm -hmm. and things that are very opaque to really cover up that really pretty watercolor underneath. Mm -hmm. But even that, even using watercolor, I use it like a caveman. I mean, I, I see other people, other watercolor artists. And I had a teacher at one point was like, this just drives me nuts. Like <laughs> you just cake it on here. Like it's acrylic. I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cause I don't know how to watercolor. Yeah. I'm not There's good no at what you know, art, but right? <laughs> yeah. So, but then other people, you know, I remember some cute girl in the class at the time was like, I really like it. Yeah. You know? And I was like, see that cute girl over there. I care what she thinks a little more than you. Yeah. Do. But, you know, see, I always thought the idea and maybe that's part of the, the beef that I had with college is that like, 
when you go for an art, it's such a weird concept to try and quantify and like grade somebody's art. I've always well, thought that was a weird it, concept. It's more about still just under, you just need to know the basics. It's like, uh, it's like anybody can build a building, but if you want to be, a, if you want to make it worth your time, you have to make sure that the, the engineering and the, the bones of the building mm-hmm. are real. So you're not, so yeah. not going to crush you or it's not just something that kind of looks cool, but it's not going to last. Okay, and that if you yeah. understand the dynamic, the, just the basics, because mm-hmm. I had tons of professors who would come and look at my work and be like, this is so funny. Please don't make serious work. Like when you make serious work, it sucks. Mm. Uh, when you make work about religion, it blows like just it's pretentious. You're not you're not really digesting it. You know, you. but when you do this and it's just funny and like psychodoodle like craziness the colors i'm really good with color they're like this is great they're like i hope that college doesn't ruin you Mm -hmm. but i really needed it i needed that structure i needed to figure out how to work as an artist to get up every day and go into my studio and paint or to know when to walk away and take a break Mm -hmm. um and again just to keep working and and going to school sometimes will i mean i'm I am really in debt. Mm-hmm. I cannot even, I wouldn't, I can't even say I would recommend someone to go, but <laughs> I, I say this and then my mother will constantly be like, yeah, but you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. Like you wouldn't know how to screen print. You wouldn't yeah, know how yeah. to. Where do um, you print now? Just curious. I just have, I mean, sometimes I work with this guy, Nick Perry, who lives in Topeka. He used to live here, Red mm-hmm. Legger Studio. Mm-hmm. You look it up, The Art of Nick Perry on Facebook. He makes incredible screen prints. Yeah. So I'll work with him sometimes so I can, you know what I mean? Like work really, uh, uh, you know, like how I do like really quickly. And then, uh, and just to just pull a print out mm-hmm. uh, out of nowhere, like in six hours with him. But mm-hmm. then by having him with me, uh, he'll it'll still look really good, you know. Yeah, like it'll yeah. still come out looking really raw, and like the aesthetic will still look like me, mm-hmm. um, where like the lines are kind of gritty and, and not, you know, because I'll just do I just work really fast, mm-hmm. so that or, or instead of using you know like a traditional screen printing technique, you know, I'll be making transparencies with like spray paint and stuff, so some of it won't show up. So there's still kind of a surprise oh, as wow, to how okay. it'll look. Yeah, see, I took a um, screen printing class in high school, so mm-hmm. I've, I don't know a ton about it, but I yeah. know the process, yeah. and I've just been looking for. I guess like a studio or somewhere to go and try and print. Well, I, I would r- recommend the Lawrence Art Center. I'm serious. It, they have a yeah. great they have a great facility down there. You can go check in and, uh, you know, I they'll think, let you use the equipment. Well, like you, the, you either take the class. They'll have a class that you go in, and then generally you'll be able to print like four projects or something. Okay. And then they'll just give you a day to come, and then you'll have the teacher present, mm-hmm. who's always a working artist, mm-hmm. and they always have super cool printmakers who work there. And then if to the point where maybe once you take a class. And sometimes they'll do open studio and you mm. just pay like 40 bucks. It's not much. That's pretty And you cool. can also give them, they, uh, the Lawrence art center has income based payments. So if you can show them your taxes, mm-hmm. um, or whatever, they're super lenient and they'll give you scholarships. So okay. anybody, I recommend anybody, if you haven't been to the art center, like they have tons of different classes, like That's painting cool. and jewelry making and ceramics. I mean, everything on acting, I mean, mm-hmm. it's crazy. And like, that, that place is such an asset. I worked there for a couple of years, full disclosure, but mm-hmm. I really, really like that place. Um, even after being let go. I think yeah. I think it's run by great people. Mm-hmm. They, by my position, I actually worked in the office, which was funny, and I taught classes there, but they, mm-hmm. my position is just kind of not needed anymore. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know what? I think this is perfect because I was getting kind of burned out working in an office and yeah. especially in a creative place yeah. where you're like, I just want to be doing this other thing. I don't want to be... Yeah. Doing your books so right what now. Are, what are you, are you doing right now? So you got the podcast. I know you DJ sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and you're doing your print work. Yeah, so I mean, here. mostly like painting, printmaking. Um, I do a lot of illustration work. Like I'm now the... Uh, I'm an associate producer on the new Mark Summers documentary. Yeah, that one you on your sent mark. Me. Yeah, 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 I did send you that. So I did the poster, movie poster for that. But mm-hmm. even that, that was like a hookup through the podcast. Where mm-hmm. I had this guy on my show who was a friend of a friend who I also was running a business with here Mm -hmm. where I was the designer. And then, but but the same guy that started the website Mm -hmm. that we made fun of schoolboy Q on. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's all kind of connected. Like the podcast essentially has given me, um, between the podcast and then like the internet, like Twitter and Facebook, Mm -hmm. um, has just given me a lot of opportunities to work with really cool people. And then generally they all just think I'm crazy. (laughs) So they're just like, Oh yeah, this guy will be fun to work with. Like he says the dumbest shit on the internet all the time. (laughs) I can't believe this. Like, and like, and then they genuinely like my work. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, now it's mostly just that. I mean, it's just like painting, printmaking, and then using that to get actual illustration work, like doing the poster. And then I did a lot of help with that movie by securing artists and uh, musicians, specifically when I say artists Mm -hmm. to then put, to get film in the movie. 
So okay. that's kind of how I was able to move up to like an associate producer level with that because I helped. I did a lot of assisting and getting music for the film. Okay, on top cool. of just doing the actual. So you design. want to do? Are you like interested in doing more work like that too? Or? You know, it's just I feel like this is just one of those things where the older you get, and if you stick with art, and you're mm-hmm. really doing art, like I just consider myself a freelance artist, mm-hmm. and you know, if people, you know, whether that's they want me to come and and be the host of something because i mean even that i get paid to host things people Mm -hmm. with if they're on the podcast like leeway franks the first anniversary i went out there and i hosted there they have like a tater tot eating competition (laughs) but we were on television all this craziness you know and then i'm i was djing the event too so i'm basically just like hosting djing um Mm -hmm. i've done it and the dj stuff is really weird um i've i've quite literally dj'd uh every type of place you can imagine yeah uh some better than others yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, to everything from parties to like festivals to I, I had a very brief stint as a strip club DJ. <laughs> I hated it. It was very bad. <laughs> Sounds but, interesting. But, you know, but again, I needed the money and it was like, sure, why not? You know, yeah, going to yeah. play rap music and like have fun. And but then quickly I was like, oh, boy. Yeah. Like this is, this is probably not my scene. <laughs> yeah. But everyone was still nice. I mean, even then I left that job and was like, everyone's cool, you know, and I met some people and it, it uh, expanded my version of what I thought was. I don't know. We all have like carry around a lot of weird judgments, and yeah. So even that, I learned. I did learn something. You Put know, put yourself in a new place. I'm yeah. sure you can. It was wild. Yeah. I mean, yeah. New experiences. Uh, well, we're at. It's already over an hour. Yeah, there so. you go. Yeah, we can probably wrap pretty soon. Yeah, we can go ahead and wrap up if that's cool. Yeah. Um, well, I'll just tell this: people can find us on iTunes, the ADD podcast with Jason Barr. That's the full name. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you want. There are older episodes because the, the the company, the parent company, is OMG LOL JK, and then we have a new company that which is mine, and then we have a new company uh, that my friend who is from uh, Oklahoma, yeah. and this is called Piece of Pie International. We call it POP Pop International, cool. and he's sort of like a new donor slash kind of like a, a business partner who's helping us fund all this stuff because he thought the podcast was important to keep going and and to support people in the Midwest, which tend to get overlooked. Yeah, and then yeah, you know we're also definitely. doing mainstream stuff, so it's not you know you don't have to live in Lawrence or live locally to enjoy the show because we talk about you know what we're watching and listening to and 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 you know just like Bazan, we get plenty of uh, national people that yeah, call yeah. in and like we're gonna have Mark Summers on from Double Dare and that he had that show Chopped, um, mm-hmm. so he'll be on soon. Uh, you know we and, yeah it's all over the place. And then if they want to check out Jason Barr, b a triple r dot com. All my a ton of my paintings are up there. B A Triple R on Twitter. Cool, man. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming and yeah, and having a cool conversation. Thanks, man. Getting, I feel like we just scratched the surface. Like I know. I this. told you, man. I was like, I, you got to get me just yeah. Like, bar uh, time. I, you man, shut it's up. already been an hour. Like, we'll just have to <laughs> cut it and do it again. No, I'll come but, back anytime, man. I love cool. love talking to you. So cool. I hope people check it out. So there it is, Jason Barr. Thanks again for coming on the show and hanging out in my living room. I hope to see you again soon. Um, keep up the good work, man, because you're honestly an inspiration, and uh, it's pretty cool to see somebody succeeding in what, I, what I'm just now getting started on. So um, I hope to continue to learn from you, and uh, I hope to continue hearing from the listeners. So again, thanks for listening. Thanks for the great feedback, and uh, leave me a like, share, review on iTunes, Facebook, YouTube, whatever, you name it. The main platform is patreon.com slash better ideas. That's where you can contribute monetarily if you choose to do so. However, if you don't have any money, that's fine. Me neither. Have a good week, everyone.